as I say, I feel slightly embarrassed because I don't feel I have the qualification maybe to be your teacher in the way you're used to in this place here. Um, my name is Barwen Walgarven. I have been a professor of Korean studies at Leiden University in the Netherlands for quite a, a while. And since last year, I, after I retired from Leiden University, I've come to um, Songun Wan University. Uh, in a way, it's fitting maybe Confucian University. And um, today, uh, doing this talk about um, the uh, the relationship between Buddhism and Confucianism, in, especially in the Chosen period, so roughly between 1400 and 1900. Um, so that's a subject I've been um, studying for a while, about which I know a little bit, and um, I hope to share it with you. And um, my main, the main thr thrust of this um, talk will be uh, that. Um, the position of Buddhism in this period, uh, the 500 years of the Chosen dynasty, has often been painted in um, uh, rather negative terms as a period of decline, of oppression of the uh, Buddhism. But I think there are uh, good reasons to nu nuance this, and uh, we cannot entirely decline, uh, deny the uh, existence of uh, certain negative factors influencing Buddhism in this period, but I think at the same time uh, there are a lot of positive things and I would like to concentrate on these things. So here in the first picture uh, you see on the left of course a Confucian scholar and uh, behind his desk and on the right a Buddhist monk by famous painter uh, Kim Hong Do, some of them you will have recognized this style already. And um, there are interesting details actually in the picture, but the picture will come back once in the, the course of my talk. And then I'll look at these uh, details. Um, first, maybe it's good to uh, repeat, I think most of you will know about this, but um, a little bit about the history of the um, relationship between Buddhism and Confucianism in the Korean history. Um, so right in the beginning, in the period of the three kingdoms, uh, Buddhism and Confucianism came in almost at the same time and in some ways I think it was even Buddhist monks uh, who brought some certain parts of Confucianism to Korea. And uh, there was a kind of a period of harmony. No one saw that these two uh, systems were in conflict with each other. And uh, you, this goes on also in Koryo, uh, let's say from the 10th century to the end of the 14th century. Um, there was no great conflict. Um, so many famous uh, Confucian scholars of this period, they um, were also Buddhists, they had a, a deep knowledge of Buddhism, they wrote poems in which they uh, expressed uh, appreciation for Buddhism. Um, then at the end of the uh, Koryo period and the beginning of the Joseon period, around 1400, uh, this started to change because then in a way you have a new form of Confucianism, uh, so Neo-Confucianism. And um, although Neo-Confucianism is said to have been influenced by Buddhism, uh, it took a different uh, attitude towards Buddhism. Uh, in a way that's logical because um, because it had been influenced by Buddhism, it was a much more comprehensive system, which in a way was much more competitive with uh, Buddhism. So Confucian scholars started to distance themselves uh, from um, the uh, from Buddhism, and when there was a new dynasty, this new Confucian attitude became the guideline, you could say, huh, of the um, new dynasty. And so all kinds of measures were taken. I'll look a bit at some of them in the next uh, picture, but um, um, against Buddhism. In spite of that, Buddhism survived, but uh, it was uh, pushed out of the public sphere, you might say. Uh, um, 
but it survived in the, in the private sphere of the people's homes and in their private life. And um, what I want to talk about is how did it survive, what forms, to what extent, and how did the relations between Buddhists and Confucians develop. Now you have a list here of the 15th century, the first century of um, uh, the new dynasty, uh, the Chosen dynasty. And um, on the left you have, let's say, the negative factors and more positive things on the right. That will be again on the left. So the new uh, uh, king, uh, the kings, they expropriated temple property and land and all other possessions of the temples. Uh, the number of the Buddhist sects was, uh, sects was reduced. Uh, Buddhist ritual uh, had been important to the state in Koryo. Uh, for instance, when there were all kinds of calamities, they would perform Buddhist rituals to try to put an end to that. But that stopped and, uh, at a certain moment in the 15th century, and instead they started to practice certain Confucian rituals. Certain um, Confucian scholars also wrote books, like uh, the famous scholar uh, Chong To John, who helped the first king to establish the new dynasty. Uh, this, uh, he wrote a book uh, called the Pul Shi uh, in which he criticized Buddhism very much. And a consequence of all these measures was that the social status of Buddhist monks became much and much lower in this period. Um, although I would like to say something else about this afterwards as well. So it's all negative, no doubt about it. It's undeniable that had, of course, influence on Buddhism in Joseon. But then, on the other hand, you see that um, the early, especially the early kings in Joseon, they still have a very intensive involvement with Buddhism in many ways. And I'll give some more examples, but. I mentioned here two kings, and uh, first King Sejong, uh, who everyone knows as the inventor of the Hangul script. And um, he, uh, at a certain moment after they had invented Hangul, and so could write Confucian, uh, 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 Korean language easily, uh, he wrote the uh, Worin Chongam Jigok, uh, a poetic work. Uh, literally, the song of the moon reflected on a thousand rivers. The moon is the Buddhist truth, uh, which is reflected in uh, innumerable ways. Um, but actually, the, this book is mainly a biography of the historical Buddha in, in verse and of earlier existence of the historical Buddha. And then uh, the second person I mention here, Seijo, was actually a, a son of Sejong, uh, I think maybe all of you know it, uh, but who did not become immediately king when uh, Sejong died, but um, first uh, there were two other kings, and the, the last of these two was deposed by his uncle, who was Sejo, and so Sejo grabbed the throne through violence, actually. Uh, um, but he was a devout Buddhist, and um, he uh, worked on a prose version of the life of the Buddha. It is, uh, had worked on that Sokpo Sangjo. And, um, and he, when he was king, he also had lots of sutras translated into Korean with the help of uh, Hangul. So he promoted Buddhism very actively. This is a picture on the wall of a Buddhist temple. I think it's from Haines, I'm not quite sure anymore, but it depicts King Sejo, and who is the other person huh, on this, this picture? Um, uh, you see that Sejo has some kind of things on his back. Uh, there is a story that King Sejo suffered from a kind of skin disease, which made him very, very uncomfortable. One day he was traveling, and he went to Odesan. And in Odesan, um, the it's famous because it's a place where you can see the famous Bodhisattva Posal, Munju Posal, Manju Sri, the Bodhisattva of Wisdom. Uh, while he was there, he discovered there was a little brook, a little water, huh? 
And he thought, well, I, I'm so itchy and scratchy, I'm going to wash myself. And he was trying to do this, but he couldn't reach it. And then suddenly a young monk appeared, or a young man appeared. Uh, he doesn't look exactly like a monk here in this picture. But, um, and said, I will do it for you, I'll wash your back. And, um, and then um, he felt much relieved, was very grateful that he said to this young man, please don't tell anyone uh, that um, uh, you have washed the back of the king, uh, because he felt ashamed. And then the young uh, boy said, well, please don't tell anyone that Manju Sri has washed your back. <laughs> So, because it's uh, it's not it's not just a young man, uh, but it's actually the Bodhisattva who's come out here. Um, so, whatever the, the the historical truth of this anecdote, uh, it shows uh, uh, it, it is truthful in as far as it shows the devotion of King Sejo to Buddhism. So, in this period, you see that. Um, uh, in the changing political circumstances uh, where the Confucians are in power, so to speak, the uh, Buddhists start to adapt their faith uh, to uh, Confucian dominance or they explain it in terms which are, um, can be easily understood by uh, Confucians. And one of the people who did this uh, was a monk called Kiha or Ham Ho Tuk Tong. And he justified Buddhism huh, by referring to the Confucian classic, the great learning, the Te Hakka, the Ta Shui. And uh, I just read what's written here. I perceive that the directives of the Tripitaka are intended to do nothing more than to prompt people to abandon passions and to realize their natures. If we teach people to cultivate themselves while relying, relying on this doctrine, so while relying on, on Buddhism, then their minds can be rectified, their persons cultivated, their families mm -hmm. regulated, the nation ordered, and all under heaven appeased. So the text in red is almost literally from the Taha, the, the Tashwe, the great learning. So, Another famous monk who um, tried to explain uh, Buddhism in terms that were uh, intelligible and, and, and convincing to Confucians was Hu Jong So San Tessa, a monk who is also very famous because he led the monks' armies when the Jap Jap Japanese invaded Korea. And he wrote uh, b b books uh, in which he uh, argued that uh, Buddhism, Confucian, and Taoism all actually are about the same thing, although there is a kind of hierarchy. And he still believed that Buddhism was still the highest form of these beliefs, but um, he saw no conflict at all. Then uh, Hugh Jung Sotantesa, he lived at the end of the, the, the uh, uh, 16th century when the Japanese invaded. Then there's a slightly later monk, some, uh, some master, Chin Gueng. And he's interesting, and the interesting thing is, is uh, it begins with the name he adopted. When you look at the characters of his name, uh, Chim, that is um, a, 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 um, a, a, a pillow huh, on which you rest your head, and Kweng uh, uh, is to, to use your arm as a pillow. Um, and where did he get his name from? He got his name uh, from a Confucian text, uh, a text written, or uh, well, maybe not written, but containing the pronouncements, uh, the sayings of Confucius, the uh, no no, uh, the Lunyu yeah, analects in English. And, um, and uh, he wrote, Tim Gang wrote a poem, and the eating of coarse rice and the drinking of water. The using of one's elbow for a pillow, Chim Gueng, joy is to be found. Wealth and rank of, to me are as passing clouds. Up till here, it's literally, there's not a character change, it's all from the Lundu, from the uh, No No. That is it's a purely Confucian text. Then he adds just one line 
aspiring to the golden days of Amitabha, the Buddha Amitabha of the Pure Land, I listen to the wind and the branches. So by adding this last line, he turns the text and makes it a Buddhist text. Uh, that, uh, uh, he is clear that he knew Confucianism very well. And, that, and that, uh, in a way, it's, it's, it's easy to understand why, because like many famous monks in this period, when he was a little boy, he had a Confucian upbringing. Uh, so, um, yeah. Then when we go on again uh, to the 18th century, there is a, a famous monk called Yondam Yu Il, um, and he uh, had lots of contacts with Confucian scholars. And he uh, um, was of the opinion that um, if you are a good Confucian, you stick to the Confucian virtues, then you will go to the, the paradise of Amitabha. And you don't actually have to become a Buddhist. Just being a good Confucian is enough huh, to um, uh, get access to the paradise of Amitabha. And so in one of his letters to, to a Confucian he wrote, it's not just the practice of Buddhism that leads one to paradise. Huh? Uh, uh, being a good person in other ways also might be sufficient. Now this was not something which um, only he believed, because in this period you have songs, eh, kasa, which are uh, especially intended to propagate the faith, in which you have very similar thinking. Uh, that, uh, And uh, certainly uh, Confucian virtues often are, or so-called Confucian virtues maybe I should say, are often mentioned in these casa. So there is a very famous of these casa from this period, it's called Pyol Kheshin Gok. Uh, and there it says, if you want to go to the Pure Land, uh, then people are interrogated and they are asked, did you do your utmost and loyal service to king and country? That so have you been uh, showing the Confucian virtue of chung, uh, loyalty. Uh, or were you filial to your parents and did you uphold family customs? And have you shown hyo, uh, filial piety, uh, to your parents? Uh, because only if you have done so, uh, then you are fit to go to the paradise of Amitabha rather than to one of the um, hells where people are punished. So the virtue of filial piety, I cannot say that it's entirely a Confucian virtue, but it's certainly very important in Confucianism. It to, up to a point, I think it, it is generally in almost any human society, people say, say that you have to be, uh, do well with your parents, huh? you have to, to obey them and be good to your parents and so on. But, um, and you certainly also have it in ancient Buddhism already. Huh? But, uh, certainly in the Chosen period, because Confucianism was the dominant um, ideology, it was stressed more strongly. And um, they did this, uh, uh, for instance, by um, printing a sutra, Pumo um, Dung Gyeong, the sutra which states that you have this enormous debt to your parents for many, all the things they have done for you as a little child, but also later in life. And the pictures I am going to show now actually are, I took at the Chogwe Sa here in, in Seoul, where they, at a certain moment there was a kind of campaign uh, to promote this kind of idea. So, and you see that uh, the, uh, the, um, the mother is taking care of the child, a uh, small child. Uh, so she swallows the bitter things and gives the sweet things to the child. So it says, uh, and then he, and then the left picture is maybe about changing the child's diapers and putting it to sleep nicely and so on. And then of course on the right side you see how the mother nurses the child. So that's all when the child is quite helpless. But um, so, uh, here you have an old version of the sutra, uh, this uh, uh, printed during the very bad picture actually unfortunately. But, uh, um, and made several editions, actually as early as the Koryo period, you have 
an edition and then in the early um, Chosun dynasty and then later on in the Chosun dynasty as well. And actually it's a king, King Chongzhou, who at a certain moment has one uh, new edition made of this sutra. Now, I stressed uh, that um, in the very first pictures, the choice, by my the choice of the first pictures, that uh, the parents do a lot for a child when the child is small, but uh, the child actually always remains a child in the eyes of the parent. Uh, so the care of the parent never stops. And this is what you see here. Uh, you see two people, and actually the person in front is also uh, already bent with age, but the mother still follows and says, take care, take care. Huh? So it is still the child who walks in front of the mother here. Uh, this picture, is, by the way, is from um, a mural on Songwa in Songwangsa. And the funny thing is that you actually you see uh, Songwangsa itself depicted also, uh, the famous temple in, uh, in the south. Uh, then, so Hyo, you is uh, stressed a lot, but also Chung. And, um, you have uh, in Buddhism also people who are regarded uh, as uh, great examples of uh, loyalty of Chung. And sometimes you have Pyo Chung Sa, this is more about the text you have here, but with a different character at the end, which is used for Confucian style shrines. But this temple, near Miryang in the south, uh, um, actually is devoted to. Uh, Buddhist monks who fought against the Japanese, and um, so they, uh, which um, brought a lot of credit to uh, the Buddhist cause. And actually, oh, you have here a description. Uh, uh, well, it's a bit too long, maybe, uh, to to read all, all of it. Uh, but um, uh, it basically, tells that originally there was a separate shrine outside the monastery. And at a certain moment, they decided to, to move it into the monastery and make it, in a way, even more Buddhist. Huh? The, the, the people worshipped the, in the old shrine were also these Buddhist monks, but now they even worship in the temple itself for this confusion and confusion between quotation marks, virtue. Um, well, it's a good chance that if you came here, huh, you have seen this because when you come from the underground and you take out the elevator up to uh, here and then you pass one of the, th the, the image of one of the three monks, Sam Yong Dan, uh, who's uh, uh, on top there and then up there. Uh, here you see how the monks are fighting against the Japanese. Um, the monks did often more than, uh, even after the invasion by the, uh, the uh, Japanese at the end of the 16th century, um, they started to work for the defense of the country, you might say, because um, one of the characteristics of Korea is that in many towns uh, you have mountain fortresses, uh, like uh, here in Seoul, you have Pukhan Sansong and Namhan Sansong. And um, the uh, permanent uh, garrison, you might say, of the uh, mountain fort is often consisted of monks. And who were, and, uh, what you then always also see often is that there is a Buddhist temple within the enclosure uh, uh, of these uh, mountain fortresses. And this and is an example in the fortress of Jinju in the south. Then, um, in Confucianism, rituals for the dead are very important. Um, and there are different kinds of uh, de de deceased people. You have people who are just ancestors in your own family. And then you have what sometimes is called the restless dead. People who have no, no descendants, for instance, to do offerings for them. Or maybe who have uh, died anonymously in great battles and things like that. Or because, and, um, um, in Buddhism, there were originally also uh, rituals for these people, uh, which were performed by the state. In the early uh, 15th century, you see this happening uh, still by the state. But then gradually, they start to do another kind of sorry, um, ritual. 
which is Confucian in style, is called Yajie. And then the state itself doesn't want anything to do with the Buddhist rituals, but people keep doing it often for their own ancestors. And then the shamanic rituals is not so important from today. Um, especially when you see the, these pictures. This is a typical picture, actually, that is um, for Korea. And you don't find pictures with this kind of style, for instance, in Japan or in China. In Japan, there is certain pictures that have certain elements in common, but not exactly the same. And it's, uh, the sweet Jew paintings, Kam no Tenghua. And here you see uh, monks who perform a ritual. There is a altar here with uh, seven Buddhas behind it. Uh, or sometimes the Buddhas are also still on a higher plane. And it's uh, for the benefit of the, de uh, the, the dead, for the uh, people who have died in an unnatural way before their time, and but also for people just in your own family uh, who uh, have passed away. And uh, these pictures are very interesting. Um, these grotesque figures here, they are hungry ghosts. Uh, there's pe people who um, are in a kind of state of purgatory and have to need, need special attention to be saved. And what you often see at the bottom of the picture is scenes from, from daily life, which includes people who die in a, a natural way, like this gentleman here who is about to be eaten by a tiger. Uh, so you have many different variants of these uh, pictures. Uh, and here you see, for instance, also a scene of battle. Huh? Um, it is kind of interesting because they're using uh, uh, guns, uh, uh, so Western weapons. And, um, uh, and another thing you see also in these pictures here, these people look suspiciously like Confucian officials or, or uh, Yang Ban. And um, in this, it's not in this picture, but in um, the Musée Guimet, the museum in Paris, they have a picture of this uh, type in which there are little labels for each group and they say Yurim. So they really emphatically uh, depicted as Confucians in, 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 in the, that picture. So um, that also is an indication huh, that people would, um, also Confucians, would have this sort of kind of ritual performed. And you see a confirmation also, also in another, oops, uh, maybe better the, this picture. Uh, here, you see people um, who were uh, mourning, so the people who have a uh, uh, family member who has just passed away and uh, the monks are performing ritual. Huh? And we know also from uh, the um, descriptions of the circumstances of making a certain picture that um, people from the royal court, court ladies and so on, had these pictures made, especially when someone at court had died. And so we, so that is uh, uh, very much concerned with the care of the um, the dead, which is also something which was important to Confucians. Um, you see this also in uh, this print, uh, especially this part that I'm interested in. Uh, what you see here is a, uh, a rosary with 108 beads, which here are identified with uh, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Jijang Wosau, for instance, at the bottom here. Uh, so in, in a way here, the, the big Buddhas, and then um, here is uh, things that have to do with death also. And then at the bottom, um, there's a description of who had this made. And it was a, a lady who did this for her deceased husband, uh, who did it for um, uh, the, her uh, deceased father, her father-in-law, and so on. Uh, so it's the care really for the 
ancestors uh, or the, the, the death in your own family which prompted people uh, to look to Buddhism uh, to help them. Um, the, in, a, in a way, this is Confucian, but there was a kind of, of course, uh, Buddhist uh, representations what might happen to you after, in the afterlife, after you had died, and um, the, in that you have the, either the possibility of being reborn uh, in the pure land of uh, Amitabha, Amitabha, or you might be punished in, in one of the hells, Tiok. Uh, and uh, this is a picture of the uh, uh, judgment process, you might say. Oops. Um, and you see there are ten judges in the uh, underworld, and uh, they have their own staff, uh, which is the regular bureaucracy, which in a way would be understandable to Confucians, uh, or so, with themselves bureaucrats. And then here you see the people who have died, who are brought in by these fearsome looking guys and uh, are treated in a way like criminals were like treated in the chosen period uh, with this uh, board around their neck, a cow, also called in Korean. Huh? And, um, and here you see what might happen if um, the judgment is negative. Uh, you are have to suffer in one of the hells, and this is the uh, um, the hell of icy torment. Uh, you, the people are freezing uh, in, in here. Now, um, these rituals were held um, before, before uh, of after, sorry, um, someone had died, but you could also have these rituals um, done while you're still alive, so as pre preparation to um, accumulate merit uh, in a Buddhist way which would help you to uh, uh, be reborn in a positive way. And um, uh, of course uh, not everyone can go to the paradise of Amitabha, but at least you can be reborn as a human being once again. Oops, uh, I keep doing this. Um, here you see three of the options uh, of rebirth. As a, as a human being, as a kind of monster, uh, of uh, uh, Asura, as a kind of, sometimes it's a kind of half god or a kind of demonic being, but also as an animal. Huh? But, um, <coughs> this has to do with the, <coughs> the process of being uh, judged. This is a kind of mirror in which is. <coughs> All your negative acts are shown, uh, karma and mirror. Uh, for instance, you might have killed uh, uh, um, an ox, and then it shows here. And then um, here you see people who have obviously led very good lives and are allowed uh, to pass over to the next phase in a more pleasant manner. This Yesu Gyeong, uh, by the way, uh, has, has nothing to do with Jesus, uh, Jesus or something, but it is uh, preliminary preparation, but practice uh, to avoid being reborn in hell. And this is an old style funeral uh, with, uh, in the, in the, behind the, the buyer here, these people in mourning very clearly. Huh? Um, so this is Confucian style. Most of these old style funerals are in Confucian style, but actually when you look at the decoration here, you see a lot of Buddhist influence. And also the songs which are sung, sung yo sorry at that time, they have a lot of Buddhist influence. In fact, uh, there are many lines in these songs uh, which um, are taken from some of the Buddhist kasa um, of the Chosun period. Uh, so you see that there is a kind of Buddhist um, uh, Confucian contact there. Then, um, very important uh, is also to have children and, and of course, especially sons, to uh, um, 
do the ancestral rituals in perpetuity. Uh, so Confucians were obliged to have people uh, to produce sons to do this. And if you didn't have children, this was seen as a lack of filial piety. And um, so whatever you do in a way to, to get sons is good from a Confucian point of view. And uh, one of the things people would do actually is go to Buddhist temples and pray there. And um, that also happened um, at the certain moment at court in the late 18th century. And uh, then a, a, a son, a young prince is born and King Zhongzhou himself, and he is very grateful uh, uh, to the Buddhists who have assisted in this, in this view. Uh, here you see a kind of picture of a couple who have prayed to the Bodhisattva Kwanem, Kwan Seon, uh, of Avalokiteshvara, and are blessed with the child, also on the temple wall. Now, there is a kind of um, narrative uh, that has been accepted quite uh, for a long time, is that in the chosen period, Buddhism goes downwards all the time becomes also very poor because of so much land has been expropriated from the Buddhists. And um, then, uh, so the monks become very poor and have to do all kinds of trades uh, to, to just to stay alive. It's not completely untrue, but it's a half truth. Uh, when you look at temples and you look at paintings of um, the Chosun period, you see that the, paint, the paintings are very sumptuous. They're beautiful. Uh, obviously not cheap things, huh? and uh, uh, there must be influential, well-to-do patrons behind pictures like what you, like you see here. Um, the same goes for books, actually. Uh, you see, when you see that there are quite a few books printed at this time, books which are written in Hanbun, uh, which is not for the uneducated, then uh, you realize that there were patrons who had both the money to uh, subsidize the publications of these books and at the, uh, on the other hand also were able to read texts like this. And so there is also a story, uh, the, this, this, this general narrative which has been popular for a long time is that uh, Buddhism, because it was oppressed, went down to the lower ranks in society and people uh, they became superstitious, uh, is a word sometimes used in modern times. And um, uh, actually, when you look at publications of books like this, you have good reasons uh, to doubt it. And it's uh, Pop Hagyong, uh, that's one of the most popular sutras. And it's not just the text published, but also the this pictures, uh, which makes it even more expensive, of course, to produce it. Another example. Again, with illustrations, uh, almost all illustri illustrated books at this time are Buddhist books. Uh, that's also a very uh, significant fact, actually. And this is a ritual handbook uh, for uh, Amitabha uh, worship. And there's one detail in here. Actually, it was also in one of the uh, other books. Uh, in books of this period, you often see that in the margin you have names of people who have paid for it. And the interesting thing is, uh, is that uh, sometimes these people are lay people uh, in many cases, but there are also cases that monks pay for uh, uh, the publication of the books. And sometimes they even add why they pay for it. And then uh, it, it appears that the, the monks also um, paid for the benefit, they paid for these things uh, to benefit their, their original parents, the parents who had given birth to them. And so the original idea, I think, in Buddhism is that when you become a monk, you leave your family, uh, Chulga, and, and um, you take a, another family name, Sok, like Sokka Moni, uh, the, the historical Buddha, but they often, they don't cut the link with their natal family completely, huh? which is uh, very good, of course, in Confucian eyes.
then um, so the, the the state itself would cut off relations huh, with um, the Buddhists, but not the people in the within the state apparatus, like the, the royal family, uh, because um, nowadays even. Huh, uh, whenever you go to a royal grave, there is always, not right in sight, but nearby, is a temple which was uh, intended to pray for the, uh, uh, the, the well-being of this king, of a, pe a person from the royal family in the afterlife. And so the t uh, temples are called one tower, where one dan is also a term. There's a quotation here for Charles Allen Clark, who was a, a Christian missionary in the beginning of the 20th century and he wrote it's interesting to note that even now and then he's talking about the 1920s wherever you find a tomb you are pretty sure to find a temple just over the hill so not right inside huh? that's also important so to keep up appearances but nearby enough that one monk at a certain moment could say that um, the people in the grave could hear the preaching that was in the temple, uh, so that there would be benefit even after death from the proximity of the temple. There's a very famous uh, example of such a temple. Uh, um, uh, oh, there are many examples, but uh, here I uh, mentioned King Yongzhou, uh, the made Yonhasa, the grave te prayer temple, Nung Chim Wontao for his predecessor, Kyongjong and his court consort, Qin Guangsa, uh, here near Seoul, was the Wandang of his Yongdo's mother, and Pong Wonsa also here in Seoul, uh, Pong Wonsa near Yonsei, uh, of uh, the grandchild. Uh, and also there was a connection, a Buddhist connection, when it came to the placenta of the king, the people of the royal family. Uh, so they had what is called in Korean, Taishil, and you see here a, a picture of the Taishil uh, of King Sunjo. And you also see uh, that the, the Buddhist temples nearby. And, um, and actually, nowadays, if you want to see one, uh, you don't have to go further than the, uh, the garden of the uh, uh, Changhyongun, because in the Japanese period, the Japanese uh, uh, moved one of these Taishil uh, to the park of the uh, Changyongbong. Uh, and then King Chongjo. Uh, I think most of you will know the story of the son of uh, King uh, uh, Yongjo, who was Chongjo's father, who at a certain moment became, became probably a little bit mad and then was killed in a kind of gruesome way, locked up in a rice chest. and. Um, uh, King Chongjo, who was about a young boy when this all happened, um, when he himself became king, wanted to rehabilitate his father, and he made a new grave for him uh, uh, near Suwon, and um, he also founded a big temple there, Yongjusa, and you can see uh, that it has something to do also with the royal family by this kind of gate, which you have nearby. Um, and the interesting thing is when Yongju Sa was a very expensive temple which was built very beautifully and uh, um, King Chongjo gathered money from all over the country actually to do it but when you look in Shilok nowadays you can look di digitally and uh, easily find every reference to um, Yongju Sa you see it's mentioned twice but only that he passed the temple uh, on his way to a shrine he also made for his father, he passed Yongjusa, that's all. So it is on the private side of his life completely, it's not public. So many temples in this way have connections with the um, royal family. And one temple also in Seoul, nowadays within Seoul, uh, is the Hengchon Sa, which is um, outside the city wall, now completely surrounded by high-rise apartments, uh, but a very old temple, which originally actually was inside the city walls, quite unusual. And um, but this uh, board here is from the late, or maybe the early 20th century even, uh, 
when you look at the calligraphy here, you see that it's very clumsy. And uh, there's a good reason for it, because it was by uh, a young prince who was six years old when he wrote it. So he, he, in fact, they just copied what he practiced. It doesn't make much sense, either Wang, Hyo, and then he had the first characters of the thousand character classic. Uh, so he was just practicing and they copied his, his practicing sheet, so to speak, and uh, enshrined it in this Hangtong Sa, a temple which had connections with the royal family in the beginning, in the early 15th century, but also in the early 20th century. So what happened in the Chosen period is uh, kind of, the soul is kind of typical. Uh, in a way, they made Seoul into a sacred city in which nothing was allowed but Confucian-style shrines. Uh, like um, here, the Songyong Wan, where Confucius is worshipped, for instance. Uh, of course, the uh, Zhongyo, the royal ancestral temple, and the Sajik altar, for, uh, which are Confucian places. Uh, so Buddhist temples were as, as far as they were inside the city walls, were removed from the city walls. Um, but when you look at old maps, you see that the country around the city wall was dotted with temples, with many temples, and there are records which show that the royal court made contributions to these temples quite regularly. Uh, this is also one of these small shrines outside the city wall. Um, I think some of you know it is near Segum, Segum Jong. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually Bodhisattva, Avalokiteshvara uh, And um, This is the place where it is one of these um, images which has, are carved out of the um, uh, a rock, uh, which are typical of Korea. And um, when uh, the first king of the uh, Chosun dynasty came to Seoul, he stopped there to pray. And so there's this old connection also, uh, and a uh, connection which remained over the years with the royal family. Then there are many temples actually here which have these connections. Uh, there's also Pongwonsa, that's near Yonse. That's not a very typical picture, but. Uh, it's Bong Unsa, uh, which is now near the uh, Coex building. So it is in a very urban area, but of course it was south of the river and uh, quite a way uh, from the center of Seoul in the chosen period. Uh, and, um, so you, you see here uh, what is now the surroundings of Bong Unsa. And there were also some temples which cared for court ladies, especially after they became widowed. And there's one, that is the Chongnyong Sa, which is um, uh, uh, just out of the city wall uh, on the eastern side of Old Seoul. And that the, where the widow of King Tanjong lived for 60 years. And so King Tanjong was uh, actually killed by his uncle Sejo when he was still a boy, but he was already married. So his wife, after that, lived for another 60 years in this place, and um, there's a nearby hill, and um, you can see Tong uh, Mang Bong, the, the peak of what, uh, looking to, toward the east, because the story is that uh, after uh, she was uh, parted from her husband, and even after he died, Every morning and evening, she would go to this hill, look to the east, and greet her husband. So, um, but this uh, general, uh, this uh, Chongop Wong, as it was called, yeah, uh, was a place where the court ladies retired up till the uh, 17th century, uh, after when uh, they became widowed. Now. I've talked a lot actually about adaptations uh, of um, uh, Buddhism uh, had to fit within a Confucian dominated context. But um, uh, actually when you look carefully at the writings of many scholars, you see uh, that um, 
many Confucian scholars were deeply interested in Buddhism. It's not that they regarded it as something superstitious or something. And they thought maybe there were some superstitious elements, but there were plenty of other things which they liked. And um, the small detail I mentioned before uh, here is that this guy here has a kind of Buddhist yonzu in front on, on his desk. Huh? Uh, you know, monk also has a yonzu of a bigger kind here. And that's quite typical. And um, there is a very well-known scholar of the um, chosen period in the West, uh, Martina Deuchler, who has written a really important book on, on Confucianism in the development of Confucianism in the chosen period. And she actually, uh, I talked to her about a month ago and told me that even in the 19th century in the area of Andong, which is regarded as one of the real centers of um, Korean Confucianism, actually the Confucianism of people, according to her, was just a kind of veneer, just a thin la layer on the outside, and they said deep in their heart they were Buddhist, actually. <laughs> but, uh, sort of, um, now you, you see many examples, actually, if you care to look for it, of Confucians who um, had a good knowledge of uh, Buddhism. And one of the uh, pieces of evidence I have is this person, Kim Manjung, who is very well known as the author of Ku and Mong, the Cloud Dream of the Nine. Nine. And he um, uh, the, I think, uh, uh, who, who does not know the story? Uh, so I, I, I think everyone knows the story more or less. Huh? So the, um, it's about a young monk who at a certain moment meets eight uh, women who are kind of sonyo, like fairies, and then um, has a kind of talk uh, with them which maybe is not entirely fitting for a, a monk. Then they're all reborn, he meets all of them, marries all of them, and then at the end of his life, he remembers that everything has been an illusion. Uh, now, the structure of this whole book is based on a sutra, uh, the Diamond Sutra, uh, the Kumbang Yong. And um, the teaching of this sutra is that fundamentally, every human being has the Buddha nature, is already enlightened. The only thing is we have not realized it. So we, uh, we need a kind of circular journey in a way to come back actually at the point where we already are and then we know that we uh, uh, then we have realized our enlightened nature and um, this is said in the there's a direct quotation from the sutra at the end uh, uh, all is dharma illusion a dream a phantasm a bubble a shadow evanescent as dew transcend as lightning and must be seen as such. Huh? So this is uh, the, 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 uh, no, nothing what we around us it has any reality actually. And the only real thing uh, is uh, this kind of deeper truth which you only realize after a certain while. And this, the, 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 the protagonist, uh, the hero of this novel, realizes it after the, he has had this uh, this, this meeting with these, uh, he has met again uh, all these women he met in an earlier life. Uh, here you see, it was an incredibly popular story in the chosen period, and you have many pictures of it also on screens, uh, uh, painted like here. Here's the monk meeting the girls, uh, and then, um, uh, but also in the embroidered uh, screens, for instance. Another famous example, uh, Tasan. So, no doubt, one of the greatest figures from Korean history. That is a man who wrote about so many different subjects and who has been described as a kind of Confucian. Uh, he had also an interest in Catholicism, so there's certain people who are absolutely convinced up to this day uh, that he was a, a kind of secret Catholic uh, after a certain moment. Um, and there is also some people who wonder, well, wasn't he really a Buddhist? Um, now I think maybe uh, asking to make a choice between these three things 
it's not the right thing because actually what you see in East Asia often that people follow different paths at the same time. Uh, so that there's no need, uh, the need you have in Christian uh, countries to just make one choice uh, and um, abjure all the other possibilities. But um, one thing is um, that he had a deep interest and in many contacts with Buddhism uh, all through his life. But he made sometimes statements that seemed a little bit conflicting. So for instance, when he was surfing at court, he once uh, had to advise King Chongzhou what to do with Buddhists. And then he said, as for monks and nuns, they have been notorious since olden times for exploiting innocent people, using tal talismans of Pujok and chanting invocations. So it is a negative view, yeah, you might say. But it is not what he himself found in Buddhism, in a way. Uh, I, I'm sure that he didn't approve this, this, this side of Buddhism, but there were plenty of other sides which he didn't mention during his talk with King Chongzhou, who, by, by the way, himself was quite sympathetic to Buddhism. Uh, so, Tansan wrote many, many poems, and in one of the poems he said, with a pine leaf hat on, sipping soup made of pine leaves, I would rather delve into Buddha's teachings in my remaining years in this world. And so this is a very strong uh, statement in the favor of Buddhism. Some other remarks he made. As I learned of equality in earning Buddhahood, good books fully packed in the stacks are not pulled out to read anymore. So he is no longer interested in Confucian style books. Uh, and then he wrote, he had many contacts with monks, and one of the monks was called Heijang. And these letters and poems he exchanged with this Heijang were collected in a book called Record of Looking at the Moon. And this Kyun, Kyun Wolchop. And um, it's, it's typical that he actually warned Heijang when he had made this book not to show it to everyone. So there was a kind of taboo a little bit on showing publicly huh, that you were a Buddhist, but privately he certainly was very much interested. Then Tasan also supported monks materially by organizing a kind of mutual aid societies. And he was a good friend of uh, famous monk Cho Yi, uh, who was a big name in the tea cult in, in uh, Korea. Another person who uh, had um, favorable views of Buddhism was the Taewangun, the father of King Kojong, uh, who you, you see him here on the po official portrait and uh, uh, on a pho photograph. A man who's often depicted very negatively, but in many ways an interesting person, an, an intellectual, a painter, uh, someone uh, in a way who deserves attention. This is in Pongmonsa. Uh, uh, this is to make people Never forget uh, for eternity. I should not forget uh, the Taewangun, uh, the Hang Son Taewangun. It says uh, that, um, yeah, Hang Son Taewangun. Uh, so, um, um, because he had made contributions to the temple. His son, King Kojong, uh, this, uh, his son, who later became the last king of the Joseon dynasty, he was ill, there were prayers. Uh, health uh, for the, the healing of the sun, he got better and then the prayers were done at Suwuksa, another temple here in Seoul, and um, was originally also a Wandan. And then Kodong said, filial piety and Buddhist faith in origin are not two. Hyo shin 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 won puri. Another famous name, a uh, famous calligrapher. Chusa Kim Jong Hee. Um, he also was someone who, uh, throughout his life, had contacts with monks, had a deep interest also in meditation. Um, and at a certain moment, he got also in contact with the monk or priest Namho Yong Gi, who was reprinting the Avatamsaka Sutra, also one of the most important sutras, the Hua uh, Om Gyong. And, um, in, which um, led to the publication of the sutra in 1856 
and then there's a long list of people who have supported it and it's really striking to see who did it, huh? who supported it. The king himself, the wife of the king, the queen dowager, huh? so the wife of a former king, the wife of a posthumous king, Ik Chong, as a king who has never been on the throne but given the title afterwards, the father-in-law of King Hong Zhong, and then, maybe most interesting, there were former, four former headmasters of the Confucian Academy, the Song Yongguan, who contributed also to the publication of the Sutra and other officials. Uh, this is the Song Yongguan, I'll uh, skip that. Uh, and then we come back to Chusa, Kim Jong-hee, the calligrapher. This is reputedly the last calligraphy he did. This is the, uh, for the building in which the wood blocks with which the Hwang Gyeong was printed were kept. It was made, they say, three days before he died. Actually, it, it also says that, um, yeah, that he wrote it while when he was ill, huh? so really in his last days. And, uh, then Kim Hong Do, uh, one of the most famous painters of the um, chosen period. And you can, when you see this picture, uh, it's almost impossible not to believe uh, that uh, um, he had a deep appreciation for Buddhism. Uh, I think there's a kind of atmosphere which is really fantastic, I think. Uh, another very interesting person, another painter, uh, but also a great intellectualist, Zhou Hiryong, who was not a young one, but a Chungin one, uh, not to be there under the young one, but a very learned person and a good painter. And, um, and he, in a way, he always remained a Confucian, but he would read Buddhist texts all the time and um, have a certain appreciation, for, especially for the style. And then um, he says the Buddhist teachings are not different from those of Confucianism. What is the difference between the Buddhist striving for the perfections, uh, paramitas, and Confucian self-cultivation? None, of course, a rhetorical question. So, um, the, 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 the traditional image of Buddhism in the Chosen Period, uh, which is even held by not a few Buddhists, is that it was an oppressed and degenerated Buddhism. Um, but there are many things which go against this idea. Huh? There, there is continued uh, support, for instance, from people who are high up in society. And uh, there, um, I have also listed a few more arguments here briefly. For instance, there are many stone monuments huh, for uh, monks uh, erected over the ages, uh, peace up. Huh? And when you check who wrote the text there, it's very often Confucians who did it. Uh, they, they like to do it. Huh? And uh, it is actually, the, they're the most common among the authors of these uh, stele inscriptions. Then Inam Ha was one of the early scholars of religions in Korea. He uh, notes uh, in his book about uh, Buddhism in uh, Korea that sun meditation uh, was very popular among 19th century intellectuals. And, uh, in the second half of the Chosen period, you see also in Seoul several lay associations who publish books uh, which have to do not so much with um, sun meditation, but, but pure land worship. And so the worship of Amitabha, the invocations of Amitabha. And these are books which are published in Chinese and Hanmun. Uh, so, uh, and the prefaces of these books are often written by Confucians who start often to note that there's a difference between Confucianism and Buddhism, but, and then they start to uh, point out the common uh, points. Huh? So altogether you see there are many interfaces for Buddhist-Confucian contact and dialogue. And um, it's hard to believe actually huh, that really Buddhism had degenerated completely, as some people uh, often say, uh, to a, something for the lower classes, for the common people, and become, as a consequence, superstitious. This is partly 
uh, because at the early 20th century you had many people who were trying to modernize and they had a kind of modernizing discourse. Actually one of these people was uh, himself also an interesting and important figure, Man He, uh, Han Yong Un, uh, the poet. Uh, but he, he rejected many aspects of um, traditional Buddhism and uh, wrongly actually I think from this kind of modernist perspective. Uh, for instance, he wanted nothing to do with, have nothing to do with the um, uh, worship of Amitabha, for instance. So that he thought it was superstition. And um, uh, he also didn't believe in reincarnation, for instance, which is kind of interesting. Uh, sometimes I ask myself, well, how do you define whether someone is a Buddhist or not? And uh, so and then some people would say, yeah, well, we believe in reincarnation. It's very basic, but he didn't believe in that. Uh, and still he's very respected. But, uh, but anyway, he, in a way, he, his influence on our image of the uh, Buddhism in the period between 1400 and 1900 has been too much negative, I think. Now is the time to rethink this. And actually, there is a new kind of consensus emerging at this moment. And so there are many books you might still find the old narrative that um, uh, the many scholars both outside and inside Korea now I think that chosen Buddhism was much more vital than it is often given credit for and uh, that's in a way which has had consequences for the 20th century and also for the 21st century because the basis actually of Buddhism uh, uh, was much stronger than uh, we, we have sometimes thought. Okay, no, yeah, yeah, I don't think that anyone, maybe, if, if you want to study more, then you kind of do it maybe with these titles, but uh, here's why I stop, and um, if there are questions, I will be very happy to answer the questions. Thank you. Let me say something. Um, last week, uh, see, I went to Japan. I visited Japan with my uh, abbot and other uh, uh, staff. Uh, I uh, visited the temples in Kyoto and the Nara and the Yasuka culture area. So I saw uh, many Buddhist remains or relics or artistic uh, paintings of Bodhisattvas uh, remained there uh, in good condition and contrast me see, compared to Korean situation see, well, we don't have uh, many we don't have them much of uh, statues or other Buddhist remains in Korea so uh, as a Buddhist uh, see, I uh, felt kind of uh, uh, respect uh, to Bud uh, Japan and the Japanese monks and the Japanese Buddhist uh, 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 like uh, <clears throat> and all, all the dynasties in, in, in Japan see, they kept uh, those things uh, in good conditions and uh, uh, there are uh, like a strong uh, strong sense of uh, uh, like uh, keeping uh, mainstreams in Buddhism, like uh, uh, in, in Chinese, Chen uh, Chen uh, like or other uh, main uh, sects uh, are very strong there and many, ha having many followers. So compared. To uh, to, with our situation, see uh, how you said to me that you studied uh, Buddhism in Japan, see, and, and uh, uh, what is your observation uh, of Buddhism in two countries? Well, it's a non-easy question because there are so many aspects, of course. It would, it would that, be uh, yeah, um, 
the one thing is that um, the physical remains of things. Huh? Uh, on the whole, I think Japanese are very good at keeping things, uh, whereas the Korean attitude is more you use it and then when it's worn, you, you replace it. <laughs> uh, uh, so um, uh, that is a kind of attitude which has something to be said for it also. But it means that, that uh, on the whole, it's not just Buddhism, huh, but uh, on the whole, uh, Japanese are in, in a way better in, in maintaining things and, and keeping things uh, in, intact and uh, not, not just replacing when it's worn out or something. Um, so it's a different attitude. I, th I think also maybe climate has something to do with it, up to a point. I think the, the, the extremes of the Korean climate uh, for very uh, muggy and, and warm in, in some way, very cold in winter, are not conducive to, to keep lots of things. Uh, so that, that, that's not entirely, uh, has not so much to do with the attitude of people, uh, except in, 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 in general, uh, not with their attitude towards Buddhism. Uh, then, um, uh, it's true, of course, there, there are some things which are very impressive in, uh, in Japan. Uh, for instance, uh, in the, near Kyoto, you have mountain, Hiesan, uh, which has a kind of uh, uh, a temple where they say fire has been kept burning for over a thousand years or something like that. Huh? It's, it's really, I have to say, a very impressive place. But um, uh, when you look uh, generally uh, at the function of Buddhism and so on, um, I think actually in some ways Korea is more, even more interesting. Um, for instance, um, one of the reasons why um, uh, Japanese Buddhism kept flourishing up to a point is the fact that in the Tokugawa period, everyone had to register at a Buddhist temple. And so it, it was their, 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 uh, their uh, variant of, let's say, Hojok, or the uh, family registers and so on. Huh? And um, so people uh, formally affiliated with uh, something like Shingon or Tendai or one of these sects, and, uh, but uh, um, their involvement uh, with, uh, with it was not very deep. Huh? It was a kind of uh, customary thing to do. Maybe also when someone died, you would call a priest and uh, he would take care of the funeral and then do, do things and so on. And you would bury the, the remains, the ashes or so, in a kind of funeral uh, cemetery which was maintained by, by Buddhist monks and so on. But it doesn't mean that people are really so much deeply thinking about it. And, and um, when you, uh, by comparison, when you look at um, the, 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 the situation in Choson, it's of course true that in some ways monks uh, have to really f to fight to survive. And, um, uh, but then um, there's also in the, in the appreciation of, of people for monks, there's a big difference um, between the average monks and what they call the learned monks. Huh? Like, like people like Chim Gueng, for instance, uh, or, 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 or uh, So Sante Sa Ke Hyu Jong. And um, uh, these people were often very highly respected also by Confucians. Huh? And, um, and in fact, in the 17th century, maybe you know how there is the Dutch people come to Korea and uh, lived there for 13 years and then they escape. And actually, uh, in the book by Hendrik Hamel, who wrote about it, he writes about this difference. He says the, 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 the common monks, they, they regard as a kind of labor force, rather, huh? but, but they really respect the learned monks. Huh? Uh, so there, there, there's this enormous difference. And um, uh, in, in, in areas which uh, are, you might say, congenial to what educated Confucians were doing. I think there, 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 there are many people who, uh, in, 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 there's a big, well, one thing also which, which um, uh, distorts things a little bit. In, in Korea, you had this examination system, Quago. When you wanted to, to pass your Quago examinations, you had really to follow Neo-Confucian, Tuja, Hak, orthodoxy. 
Um, so you have to really follow this narrow path. In Japan you didn't have this, huh? so people could anyway read everything. Now, it's not that Koreans would, Korean um, scholars wouldn't read everything, but they would keep quiet about it, uh, at least when they were writing essays or when they were writing formal things to the government. So only when you have, let's say, private writings or poetry or something, you, you see actually what they were reading in reality. Huh? Uh, and they, they would read Taoist books, they would read Buddhist books, and so on. And um, uh, I think actually uh, when you look over the, the entire period, you see that in the beginning, for instance, many kings are very devout Buddhists, like Sejong was a devout Buddhist, also still Seijo also, uh, although he didn't always show it in his practice, let's say, uh, he killed his nephew, for instance, uh, and, uh, but, um, and other people, uh, but um, yeah, maybe that's politics. Uh, that's, <laughs> and, uh, but then uh, in, in, in the same period, sometimes uh, Neo-Confucian scholars will attack Buddhist temples and, and shamanic shrines also. So it's very, a bit violent. Then when you come to the second half of the, the chosen period, you see that there's a kind of change also. Uh, which is favorable to Buddhism also. And um, by the, the 18th century, for instance, you also you see that people start to import Buddhist books from China. And in the 19th century also, and they reissue them in Korea. And at the same time, you have at that time a uh, kind of widening of people with education. That is in the begin, beginning, it's mainly real young bang who get a good education. Uh, but in the 19th century, 18th century, 19th century, you get these urban centers like Seoul, but also maybe a city like Chongju. Uh, and um, you have many people there who start to read, and they're, inter they're, they're almost uniformly also interested in Buddhism. So um, uh, I think a lot more study of, of what, what they were writing in their private writings uh, can help us to, to understand. Well, the, really the position of um, um, Buddhism in the chosen period and I think eventually the, sometimes the, the interest they had was, was deeper than let's say average and interest in Buddhism in Japan where Buddhism was more still a part of official life also that's for sure uh, but um, in spite of that I think uh, the Korean people had a kind of um, yeah, more intense relationship with Buddhism in some ways, I, I, I think, yeah, certainly intellectually. Uh, uh, uh. Well, again, uh, in, in this respect, the um, absence of the government examinations is important, huh? because there was, of course, you had people who were uh, more or less orthodox neo-Confucians, like uh, the Hayashi family scholars in, in Edo, uh, present Tokyo, but um, there was not this pressure to follow just one strand of Confucianism. So there's more diversity to, to begin with. Huh? For instance, um, an important form of Confucianism is Wang Yangming, uh, but it was not orthodoxy in Korea. So um, if you would write a government examination essay, you had better not mention anything about Wang Yangming. In, 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 in Japan, of course, there was no uh, problem with doing this. Um, so, in a, in a way, it was easier in Japan to develop 
a kind of uh, variation in forms of Confucianism. That's actually what you, you do see. You know? uh, and, you, and you see also kind of hybrid forms sometimes of um, uh, belief, huh? where it's difficult to say, well, is this still Confucianism or is it more Buddhist or is, is it maybe a kind of early example of what we nowadays call new religion. For instance, you have you had something which was popular among merchants, uh, Shingaku, the heart learning, uh, so, which certainly was partly Confucian influenced and uh, but also had elements of other faith uh, in it. And uh, so um, there's an enormous variation in, in a way uh, uh, makes it interesting. Uh, it's in, a, in, a, in a way, the uh, examination system is responsible for a kind of um, homogenization of, of, uh, of, of any way what of public expressions of uh, what people uh, were thinking. Uh, uh, because in, in Korea too, of course, people would read Wang Yangming and oh, the, oh, Wang Yangming. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, he, it's, it's a kind of um, uh, strand. It's, it's also considered to be Neo-Confucianism, but it is um, uh, Wang Yang uh, Yang. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I still, uh, uh, and uh, so uh, more uh, uh, emphasizing inner feelings and things like that. Uh, that uh, uh, in, in, in a way, I think a kind of Confucian was even which is closer to Buddhism, maybe. But, uh, but in, in Korea, you see there's influence of the Wang Yangming school, for instance, in uh, Dong Hak thinking in the 19th century. So people read it. But they would be careful with it, <laughs> with their knowledge. Uh, among themselves, they might talk about it, but uh, uh, it, is not, it was not so. Uh, uh, 